Denver. It's really nice to meet you guys uh, and see you guys. I've heard a lot about you. And good day, everyone. And a very, well, a very warm welcome to today's webinar presented by Culture of Allegiance and Pharamonia. So I am your host, Mena. And on behalf of the CL team, I would like to thank you for joining us today with an intriguing topic, which is culture and impacts on lean and agile transformation. So before we begin, I'd like to give you all a briefing of cultural lesions and pharamonia. For those who don't know, cultural lesions is an agile HR transformation company founded with an intense drive to transformation in organizations, individuals, and management students. We offer consulting and coaching services, as well as organized uh, agile HR training workshops and certification programs. As for Ferromania, it's, in, it's an Argentina-based company and partner of Cultural Legions and Agile People Ops. Uh, Laura Orlana is the founder of Ferromania. Hello, Laura. And we have Oh, we can Hello. <laughs> so the company offers projects and change management services, management consulting, and agile people of training. Now, I would like to call our director, Ms. Lakshmi, to introduce you to our dear guest and speaker of the day. Thank you, Manal. Thank you, Laura. And a very, very warm welcome to each one of you. Thank you for joining us for today's session. And with no further delay, I would love to introduce you all to Kathy Permi. She is the managing partner of Permi and Peterson Associates, my life coach, my mentor. And I just want to take this privilege over here on this open platform that uh, I would say that she, she, she is a wonderful person. And thank you for, for everything, Kathy, till date. Mm. And uh, it's an honor to welcome you here to serve as a speaker for both cultural legions and Parmonia. So please feel free to introduce yourself and the stage is all yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. So uh, folks, I, I met Lakshmi in 2015 when she was a student of mine in the uh, Human Synergistics Culture Workshop in which I was one of the trainers. And I was immediately taken by Lakshmi because she really had a vision for the future of what and how she really wanted to work and, and her passion around HR and culture and her experience in recruiting. And, and, and so uh, we hit it off pretty quick and she ended up working, doing some work with me and one of my clients. It was actually, we did a culture study at a correctional institution in the United States. And uh, correctional institution, those are, it's, it's a prison, right? Okay, so, so that was, uh, it was a very interesting experience. And, um, and so we have been working together ever since, and I am just uh, pleased to be here. Uh, to, and I will honestly say I have never been in an audience uh, this diverse in terms of countries around the world. So uh, usually I'm talking to folks in Minnesota and we have uh, almost Canadian accents. So um, please forgive me if, if I use words and accents that are not sounding normal to you. So anyway, um, uh, and then my business partner is Amber Peterson. You can see her uh, and she and I uh, are together now in Permian Peterson Associates for the last several years, so. We can go on to the next slide. So um, I'm, I am actually looking for five people. So one of the things about me is that I, I do best in these kinds of virtual seminars of A, I can see people, people's faces and B, I can understand what drew you to here and what you're looking forward for out of this. So I would like maybe five people to introduce themselves. Just what's your name? and the way you would pronounce it, not the way I would pronounce it. Um, and uh, what is your role or your job? And then what drew you to this session? So five people. And I would say that if we don't have five people in the next couple of minutes, I will ask Lakshmi and or Manal to uh, call on some, some folks. So it's probably better to volunteer. Hi, Kathy. 
Hello. Hello. My name is Tejashree. Hello. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tejashree. I'm a PO intern in, uh, in cultural regions. And uh, as I always had uh, interest towards uh, the passion towards HR, I always wanted to work as an HR. That is the reason why I uh, have uh, uh, started up my uh, second inning career after uh, six years of uh, maternity break. And okay. I am ready to bounce back and uh, make my career in uh, HR, and especially, uh, especially in agile HR. It, 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 it was the, I, I never knew about it, anything, but, uh, recently, I uh, when I started to start my second inning career, then I was uh, uh, checking out and looking out for different options wherein I can uh, suit myself. And I found Agile HR would be best for me. So I chose uh, Cultural Legends to start up my career, second inning career. Okay. That's Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Who else? Thank you so much. Okay. Hi. Hello. 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 Hi. Um, hi, my name is Magezi, and I am from South Africa. And oh. I am actually a former um, social media marketing intern for Culture Legions. Um, my internship okay. literally ended last week. And what drew me to this session, although my internship ended, I felt the need to attend the session because I wanted to expand more and get more knowledge on what um, culture and HR, when they come together, what do they do? So, um, and how transformation works in impacting lives or in impacting HR. I'm not big on HR because I didn't study HR, but this session and working with Culture Legions has actually opened my mind to seeing how HR affects lives and affects business entities. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Madam Kathy, how are you, Hi. madam? Hello. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my, my name is Lelo M.E. and I'm from South Africa. Okay. Yes, um, I am a student here in the University of Limpopo. I'm doing a master's in development studies. Yes, uh, what drew me to this session is because I have a strong passion and interest in these things of cultural uh, aspects because I am an author as well and I'm writing a paper currently about the, the indigenous knowledge system because we cannot oh. talk about a culture without inculcating or including um, some part of indigenous knowledge system. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to gain a lot of knowledge from this um, session so that I can perhaps uh, add some ingredient on my paper. Okay, all right, great, thank you. And who else? Hi, it's Nadia yeah. speaking. Yeah, hi everyone. Yeah. Um, we've got Nadia and Deborah that would both like to. Nadia, why don't you go first and then Deborah go next? Hi, um, I'm Nadia. I am from South Africa. I'm also an intern at Culture Legions. And um, I think what drew me to this session was the whole thing around culture and understanding it in the HR setup. Um, what makes Culture Legion special is that we work across the globe, so we get to interact with people from all over, and I think this will add value to how we interact and go forward. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank you. And Deborah. Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Deborah Olale. I'm a former um, social media marketing intern at Culture Legion. I actually got... Um, I was drawn to this section because I want to gain more um, knowledge about Agile. Because actually, I already wrote my Scrum Master certification um, in January. So I know a little bit about Agile. So I just want to like refresh myself and go deep into culture and how to relate with others outside our managing pro um, project, but also to manage in all, um, human. Because without human, you can handle the project. 
So I just want to like know more and dive into it. That's why I'm here today. All right, great, thank you. I appreciate all of you who have, um, Amber, did you say have something or no? Yes, we have one person who rose their hand as well. Um, and okay. I, I just wanna note that Oh uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation in this. And we don't get this in the US. Let's be honest yeah. here. We don't get five people who want to introduce themselves. So this is lovely. So yes. if, if you would be okay with one more person, Kathy. Uh, yeah, absolutely. To, um, mm -hmm. The person who has their hand raised, introduce uh, themselves. Boitemelo, please go ahead. Um, um, hello. I'm sorry, my name is Boitemelo. Um, my job role in Culture Allegiance, I was a social media marketing um, intern. I am now a public, uh, sorry, a people um, operations intern. Um, oh. what, what drew me to the session um, and basically Culture Allegiance is I enjoy working with people and um, with Culture Allegiance, I get to interact with people of different cultures and, and backgrounds. Um, and I get to learn more about them. Um, what drew me to the session is basically just learning, what, wanting to gain more knowledge, you know. Um, I have a thirst for knowledge and this session is one way for me in order to get more knowledge. Thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. So what I'm hearing is that um, a lot of you are, um, um, are, really in, are really driven by your passion for HR and wanting to see how you can use and your work with HR to really kind of improve the world, you might say, and businesses, et cetera. And, and one piece of this that drew you to the session was wanting to know a little bit more about culture. Now, many of you want to know a lot more about culture, but we have only got an hour, right? So uh, we're going to give you a little bit more. And then if you want some more, we can suggest some places to go to get some more, OK? All right. So if we could go to the next slide, please. All right, so our objectives uh, for today is, um, I wanna talk to you a little bit about what culture is and what it isn't. So we wanna define it for you. And then we're gonna talk about how, you, how it's formed over time, how it evolves over time. And, and we're gonna show you, uh, and this is wonderful that you are from all over the world, we're gonna show you a model for culture that is research-based that is literally in all over the world. I mean, the human synergistics model, which is very well research-based, can, can, is, is sold and used and um, consulted with in countries across the world in all the continents. And so it's a wonderful tool for you folks. Uh, we're also going to talk to, to you about how culture and lean and agile interact and how it shows up in some typical interactions. Now, the one thing I also wanna say is occasionally I might slip and call this agile because in the United States, we call it agile versus agile, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I recognize that it's called agile. So I'm going to just forgive the little slips if it comes out. Uh, we'll also show you what the research shows about the culture uh, and its success. And, and, and the other thing is if you're working in an organization that is, is implementing agile mindset, um, how can you work both at the same time, the culture and the agile mindset? And Lakshmi will actually be working with me to kind of talk through some of these things as we go through. At the end, we'll have some time for questions, an open forum, et cetera. And uh, feel free, as and when you have any questions, feel free to put that in the chat box and Manal and the team will look into this and we will definitely address your questions towards the end of the session. Okay. okay, so let's go to the next slide. I want to tell you a little bit about what started my culture journey. So uh, I in, back in 1995, and I recognize many of you may not have been born by then. However, um, I was at a, at a uh, seminar in Chicago in the United States and uh, that was put on by Fast Company, which is an entrepreneurial magazine in the United States. And, and in the 1990s, late 80s and 1990s, the great, great grandfather of Agile and Lean was called Total Quality Management, all right? 
And that was a lot about process improvement, et cetera. And by the early 1990s, um, it was getting a bad name because there were organizations that were struggling with the implementation. Some, some would implement total quality management and fail completely. Others would implement it and be very successful. So two researchers, uh, Peter Sorensen and Teresa Yeager from the University of Chicago decided to do a study back in the early 90s about what what kind of culture supports this kind of a transformation? And they used human synergistics uh, tool called the organizational culture inventory. And what they found, and we'll, we'll, I'm gonna show you this in a little bit, but what they found was that those organizations that had the most success in, uh, in implementing total quality management, again, the great, great grandfather, uh, or grandmother of lean and agile um, had a profile, a culture profile that looked like the outline that you see, that dark blue outline, okay? And, and those that did not had the, um, the, the colorings of the, um, the red and the green and the light blue, okay? So you see there's a difference there right off the bat. And I was hooked. I thought, I have to find out more about what this culture tool is. And so that started my culture journey. So let's go on to the next slide. And so let's talk about what culture is. It's, it's actually defined as the way we are expected to do things around here. I contend that anyone who joins an organization within the first two weeks to two months will innately know what they have to do to fit in and on that organization and or succeed or survive in that organization because of the fact that it's this is the stuff that's not written on the walls so to speak you know you've got values written on the walls you've got mission statements etc but the way people interact with you the way that um, people give you advice and talk to you etc gives you clues immediately about whether or not you're expected to bring your whole self to work, your brain, or just do what you're told, or you're allowed to disagree with somebody, um, et cetera. So the way you're expected to do things around here is what culture is about. So let's go to the next slide. So culture is built, uh, Edgar Schein is the, is the quote, considered the father of organizational culture because in the 1960s, he actually coined the term for the very first time, organizational culture. And his perspective is that culture is built through shared learning and mutual experience. So the original entrepreneur maybe of a company will, um, will gather a team about them and, and any team actually would, would have this kind of experience. You have something to do. You have a project and you do it, you work, it succeeds. And you said, ah, that worked, let's try that again. And, and so you continue to do this. You have some shared learning about what works. You have some mutual experience in that it did. And so you keep repeating these things to the point where it becomes embedded in about how you actually work. It becomes, it becomes your culture and, and, and when you hear people in organizations say, well, that's not how we do things around here, they're actually trying to tell you about their culture, okay? Or this is how we do things around here is, again, they're telling you about their culture. So culture is uh, often considered to be eight to 12 years old at a minimum, okay? At a minimum sometimes longer, okay? And that's because some of these behaviors and expectations are hardwired into organizations now. And as a result, that's hard to change. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, so there are a lot of different tools out there, studies, uh, surveys, and, and they can be defined into two different kinds. Um, a climate survey, and a culture survey. 
A climate survey asks you whether or not you like your boss, how clear is the mission, do you like you, the, where you work, how, how safe do you feel in it? It really measures engagement, uh, do you like your job, et cetera. And, and that is all the stuff um, on top. If you notice there's a tree with roots, that is all the stuff that, that is on the top of the tree. That's like the leaves, okay, of the tree. Underneath it is actually what causes the tree to grow, which are the roots. And that's actually the culture. The culture drives what comes out of it. And so the culture is about expectations. For instance, if you're in, come into a company and you are, you, the sense that of expectation is you are expected to take on challenging tasks. You're expected to know the business and share your ideas. You're going to act differently than someone who has comes into an organization and is basically very quickly learns that if you rock the boat or you make a mistake, you're in trouble. Okay. And so think about the differences there. If you are knowing that you're going to be um, knowing the business, taking challenging tasks, your ideas are going to be uh, in, in invited and respected, you're probably going to be more engaged, i.e. the leaves on the tree, all right, versus the roots, okay? So culture is about expectations and, and what and how we're expected to act around here. Next slide, please. So the tool that we use and from Human Synergistics, and I, and I believe somebody from Human Synergistics is also part of this session um, and can talk about it a little bit more later. But this is a tool that has been um, created almost 46 years ago and has a body of research around on it around the world. Um, as if, if you're all HR students, you probably know about Maslow's theory. And you'll see that um, it's a clock, but the way the clock is organized is that they have 12 different styles. And in those styles, um, the, the top style, the 12 o'clock style is called self-actualizing and the bottom style is called avoidance. So that the, the styles come around the circumplex in terms of how well they match Maslow's theory about whether you need security or belonging or self-actualization, et cetera, okay? On the left and the right axes, that's about how I attain that either through focusing on the work, the task, or how I do that with people, all right, in the relationships in the organization. And so that also comes from management theory, um, uh, a McGregor and Ardress theory, X3, theory Y, that kind of stuff, okay? So, so this is well-researched, well-grounded in organization development, human, human uh, resources theory. And, um, and, and they have now measured it. They've benchmarked this around the world. So you can actually benchmark your organization or an organization against um, constructive styles and or um, what others are doing and see what historical averages are and what the best looks like. This next, next slide, please. So they're, from their research over all of these years, they have found they are 12 different styles specifically, but they've found that they kind of group into three different clusters. The first cluster is called the constructive cluster. And these are the styles that, that um, it's called the achievement style, which makes people which the expectation is you, you know the job, you know the work, you uh, see how your work lines up with the mission of the organization and the goals. Uh, the self-actualizing that you're bringing your ideas to work, that you have integrity around your work and, um, and that you are growing as an individual along with your work. The uh, human is the encouraging style, which says that you are going to share your ideas. You're going to invite others' ideas. You're going to collaborate. And in the affiliative style, which says that you're going to have open and honest communication and that when you have conflict, it's going to be, um, you're going to have productive ways to discuss it. Now, if you can think about that, think about why that's constructive. Because those, through their research, they found that those 
four styles, constructive styles, actually promote then effective goal setting, achievement, earnings, and they've got studies around that, teamwork, collaboration, um, and, and, and high engagement um, in terms of employees and retention and satisfaction. They found another group of cluster, a cluster called the passive defensive cluster. And this cluster has four styles in it, which I'll very quickly uh, talk about. And, and, and one of them is now we're getting closer on the Maslow's hierarchy um, to belonging, right? We want to belong here and we want to belong with people. So that, that three o'clock style is uh, the approval style. That means I want to get along, go along. I want you to like me. So if I have a difference of opinion, I'm not going to say it, okay? Uh, the conventional style says, I really want you to like me and I want to do something, but I have to follow my job description. I follow the process. Um, if there's something that goes beyond that, I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm sorry I can't help you, but the job description, the process says. Uh, the dependent style says, ooh, I don't want to tick off my boss. So therefore, I want to make sure that I do what my boss says and I'm not going to do anything that my boss doesn't tell me to do. And, uh, and then the last is the avoidance style, which is basically the most security oriented style, uh, it, which is I'm not going to volunteer for anything. I'm just going to keep my head down. I'm going to shut up. I'm not going to do anything because to do so gets me into trouble. So as you, you can see that if this is the culture of the organization, it's passive defensive, it's, it's not moving. It's not moving fast because people are afraid to step out um, and they want to be liked because to be liked by the folks higher up protects you in your job. So th these kinds of cultures lead to conformity, rigidity, and a lack of accountability. Now, the other thing about these things is that highly bureaucratic organizations, and if you are in the private sector, I would say you're probably going out of business soon. Because if that's the way it is, nobody's making decisions, nobody's moving, okay? The next set is the aggressive defensive. And again, our, on the Maslow's hierarchy now, we're still focused on our security needs. We're focused on uh, belonging, but this time we're not worried about people. In fact, give a rip about people, who cares? We're focused on getting the job done because getting the job done will keep us safe, right? All right, now, and so there, it's much more aggressive in tone. And so they talk about the oppositional style, which is always pointing out flaws and that you're doing it wrong and you're doing it wrong and you're doing it wrong. Um, the power styles, which is, I'm just gonna do it and I ask for permission later. The uh, competitive styles, which is, I'm gonna go after all the resources that I can and I don't care if it steps on you and it steps on you and it steps on you. And then the perfectionistic style, which is, oh my gosh, I just I have to do this perfectly because if I don't do this perfectly, I could get fired. Okay. So as you can see, there's no, no empathy for others necessarily in the aggressive styles. It's all about getting the job done because getting the job done protects you in the organization. So in those organizations that have those kinds of styles can be really hard to work for. Um, in in uh, the results economically are that if, if they're riding a wave of, uh, if, if they have the only patent on it, for instance, they could be aggressive defensive and probably still make money and be okay at the same time if things change, the population changes, a pandemic occurs, right? It's gonna be really hard for those folks to, to um, adapt to new circumstances because they have very lack of, lack of teamwork, lack of overall uh, people goals. So moving on to the next. So now do you see why in 1994 that showed that the organizations that had constructive styles were the most successful at implementing total quality management systems. Does that make sense now? 
And if so, everybody put a thumb up in your, in your uh, if that makes sense to you, so Amber can find out, okay? If that makes sense. Yeah, so now we can see it, right? So going on to the next slide. There's a lot of things that go into creating culture. And the cool thing about the human synergistics product is not only do they measure culture, they'll also measure, for instance, the ideal culture. So there's an ideal culture that you want. That's the highly blue, possibly. Um, and then, um, and there's a lot of things and the blue things that going into it is, yes, we do want those values and strategies and mission on the wall. We do, because that guy, that's supposed to guide, that's the ideal, it's supposed to guide us moving forward. Um, and, and then, but the question then is, how do we take those goals, that mission, those values and embed that into the things in the middle? The decision-making structures, the management structures, how organizations are run, the kind of systems that they use, both human resource systems, at agile, lean systems, you know, inventory systems, purchasing systems, uh, lots of systems that they've gotten there. The technology that they use and how technology is used, how jobs are designed. In, in the United States, we have something called the McJob. I don't know if anybody's Mc, familiar with McDonald's, you know, McDonald's. We have something called the McJob. A McJob is where you're not expected to even be able to read, believe it or not. All you have to do is look at a keyboard and when somebody says that you want a Big Mac, you take a picture, you press the key with the picture of the Big Mac. All right, that's a McJob. You're not expected to have any skills whatsoever. All right, and, and so how exciting would that be, do you think? So the way the jobs are defined um, versus being like a cultural intelligence intern and the kind of work that you're doing, which might be very varied, take a lot of skills, you learn a lot. That's a different job design. And the last thing is about the skills and qualities of the people involved. So it, if you have a, an organization in which you've got a lot of systems working, but at the same time, you have either management leaders or others who don't know how to communicate well um, and or don't know how to deal with conflict well um, or have other issues, you may not be able to pull off uh, the whole cultural transformation. So it takes a look at all of these things. So the cool thing about the tool from Human Synergistics is that not only will you see the ideal and what you've got, the current, but you will, through their research, come out with all the factors that are impacting and creating that, okay, for you, and know where to focus your time and attention. As a consultant, what I like about this is that it gives me, um, it gives me the knowledge to know where to focus my efforts in terms of transformation, okay. Now, the other thing is what comes out on the right side of this is, as we talked about, you will come out from culture with people that are, that, um, are gonna be satisfied with their jobs, be motivated, uh, wanna stay and or leave. At the group level, you'll come out with teamwork um, and quality work. At the organizational level, you'll be able to come out with various levels of adaptability uh, to what's going on in the environment, as well as the quality uh, of the overall effectiveness of the organization. So then you see actually the results as well. So a lot of things go into creating culture um, and, and we're not gonna be able to talk to all of them, but um, you can use the tools at the very bottom that show you what they are as a consultant and working with organizations. And when I say consultant, you can be an internal consultant working in HR and using these tools, okay? So next, next slide, please. All right, um, so let's talk a little bit about how the agile mindset works with constructive cultures. I'm gonna hand it over to Lakshmi at this point. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, so before even we get into that, 
out there, that title that's there, right? So let's first understand a little bit about Agile. So Agile has been in the IT industry folks for more than two decades. And people across the industry, I would say the IT industry, they call it as a framework, Agile as a framework, as a methodology, as a system and whatnot. And you might be surprised to know that there are more than 40 plus flavors of Agile methodology, like um, Scrum, Scaled Agile Framework, Less Extreme Programming, you name it, and it's out there. But what is important for each one of you to understand is that no matter what flavor of Agile you use or you practice, the whole essence or the core essence of Agile is delivering value to customers. Now, for organizations, um, the customers can be other organizations. It could be enterprise, corporations, small and medium scale uh, firms, and, or, or even startups for that matter. But for people operations, human capital, or traditionally referred to as the HRs, the customers are none other than the candidates and the employees. So if value has to be delivered to the employees, candidates, stakeholders, and anybody, you know, any other organization, it is logical for you all to understand that people can't work in silos and deliver value. What is required is that People should work in teams. They have to go ahead and collaboratively work with each other. They need to introspect with each other and try to see if there is a way to adapt their processes, their interactions that best suit the team and together collectively and in a very synergistic way, they're able to deliver that value to the customers, right? So if such is the case, then what is required is to embrace what we call as an agile mindset. Now, um, off late, very recently, I would say people have started believing that agile is more than this methodology. It is more than a, uh, you know, um, a framework. It is more of a philosophy. It is more of a mindset. And the agile mindset is all about the mindset of growth and change, right? So individuals, uh, I would uh, say that, you know, our practitioners, including me, we say that don't do agile, but be agile, right? So doing agile is all about like, you are tunnel visioning yourself to a particular process, okay? But do remember that um, who, who practices or who puts the process in place? Who works on that process? It's none other than the people, okay? So we can't eliminate the people element out from there, right? So it's all about, you know, how can we as people be agile, which means how can we bring in those behavioral shifts within ourselves, take that ownership to change our behaviors in a way that we can collectively work towards making not only our professional career, you know, at, at a better, you know, in a better way, but also helping the organization to become more sustainable. And when internal stakeholders, people within the organization are happy, you obviously see that happiness getting mirrored when the service is being provided to the customers. So having this agile mindset is so very important and it calls in for each and every one of us to take that ownership towards continuous learning. Um, you all might have, under, you know, uh, I would say, uh, I've heard that um, change is constant, right? But recently I've started saying that learning is constant because mm. if you don't get into that continuous learning journey, you don't take the ownership Nobody else is going to come and take you over there. It's you and you can make that change happen, right? So, so that's the whole essence of agile mindset. So, uh, I mean, Kathy did a great job in explaining about the three cultural styles, right? So 
which cultural style, you know, having heard, you know, what each of these cultural style is, what is important is maybe y'all can participate two minutes, you know, answering like, which is that cultural style, which will help individuals, teams within the organization build the agile mindset. Uh, so two minutes, you can either unmute yourself, share your perspective, or else you could go ahead and put it in the chat box. Um, and, and we can just, you know, call that out, I would say, if you're putting it in the chat. So which cultural style you think will help individuals, teams build an agile mindset? Constructive, passive defensive, or aggressive defensive? Okay, thank you, Nadia, Shalini. Okay. Okay, Megacy, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so great to see this. So Kathy, everybody has been paying attention to what you have been sharing. <laughs> so wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so we're good. Seems like sure. seems like people are fairly united, locked me in in uh, mm -hmm. in that constructive is the way to go. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and all of them are the young gens, you see. So the young gens are calling out loudly saying that constructive way to go, you know. Okay, yeah. so thank you everyone for participating. Now let's move on to the next, which is, okay. So what you see over here is a Kanban board for hiring. Um, now, people who are not familiar with the term Kanban, it's very simple to remember uh, that it's a visual board. Kanban equates to a visual board, a board wherein you see the workflow, right? So what you see over here is the workflow of the hiring process or the recruitment process. So there are a huge bunch of requirements. It could be open new requirements, backfills and whatnot, right? All the requirements are out there in this backlog. People, I would say the recruitment team, they do the sourcing, screening, they go ahead and conduct interviews. It could vary from one to two to many, depending on the organization, the business unit, and finally the candidates get selected. Now, all of you, even though if you're not from the HR, you can still, you know, understand, considering that all of you would have played the role of a candidate, you know, getting interviewed at some or the other organization, right? Or if you are already the people operations members in cultural agents or anywhere else, you can as well, very well relate to this board. So keeping this board in mind, let's explore, let's, let's you know, imagine there is the situation out there. Uh, as it's, it's pretty evident, right, on this board that there is so many requirements to be filled. People are out there to be sourced and screened. Maybe there are many more in the pipeline, somewhere lying down in that, you know, internal database of the organization system and the recruiters are yet to, you know, uh, go ahead and look into them. So many to be interviewed, right? And still there is only one selection that has happened, right? So what this board shows is that there is a lot of work in process, okay? And the team is behind in terms of meeting those hiring deadlines. Management is obviously, they are concerned and they are worrying that if the hiring target is missed, there will be million loss with the project that is in hand. Customers might feel, you know, out of place. They might go ahead and pull off or revoke that project, which would lead to a loss for this organization. So keep this in mind, imagine this, and let's walk through some of the scenarios. Over to you, Kathy. All right, so Lakshmi and I are gonna talk through some of these different things and then uh, certainly feel free to to add in on the chat if you have uh, some additional experiences with this. So Lakshmi, we're gonna start looking at the aggressive, uh, an organization that is primarily aggressive defensive. So um, again, in this organization, people are trying to get the task done and not have anything to necessarily worry about people. So um, always pointing out flaws, you know, taking charge, trying to take control, very competitive. And, um, and trying not to make mistakes. So in this organization, if, if they're really worried um, 
about actually getting the hires done, how might, in this kind of a cultural style, how might the hiring manager react, do you think, in this kind of an organization? He would be, the hiring managers, again, as, as rightly pointed earlier, they will not be focusing on the people aspect. They won't be bothered about the recruiters who are doing this job. They will not bother about any other stakeholders that are there. What matters to them is getting the work done, which means getting closures on those requisitions that are open. And they are not ready to face the customer with a big no, because their power, their position, their leadership, or whatever you know they are at in whichever top layer they are in, that would become questionable. And they don't want to cut a sorry figure before the customer. So they would go ahead and put in all the possible you know it's, it's like get all the world's pressure and put it on the recruitment team on the human resource uh business partners and others saying that do whatever you want but i need the closures happening you want that your team should work late nights you want the team should go do that overtime um work on weekends do it i don't care i want my numbers to be met i want my project to be successful okay all right thank you so how do you think how do you think in in this style if if the recruiters were also in this style how do you think that they would be reacting how would what their behavior look like okay so so okay so before i get into the recruiters piece i wanted to mention one more additional scenario okay. of kathy okay sorry i missed it earlier but then no, no um, problem so if the hiring managers, let's say there are different business units out there and the organization talks about internal mobility, that is moving candidates from one business unit to another business unit, and it's an aggressive defensive style, then one manager, the BU head, the business unit head, would not go ahead and allow and give his team member to any other business unit with the selfish thought saying that hey you know what if i give my team member resource in quotes they would call them as resource if i give my resource to another bu what will happen to my bu it would be at loss i am going to lose an individual and my project my client will not allow that so i you know own it i keep it within me and so the internal mobility which is supposed to be one of the upcoming trends to you know to to for crowdsourcing or for you know building in that internal talent will become zero within the organization mm -hmm. so in such a case it's like again you know there is this internal competition that's going to a great extent so that would be yet another uh, behavior that we would see from hiring managers um coming to the recruiters it would be like Oh, come on, you know, firstly, the entire team would be burnt out, stressed out, because they can't, you know, they can't go ahead and get candidates, you know, they can't manufacture candidates from nowhere, right, if people are not applying, and the hiring manager is not ready to listen to that. Uh, so they would be getting, you know, stressed out, burnt out, that's there, but the other piece is that we would also see internal competition among the recruiters so let's say team member a b c a has done something you know out there and needs support you know maybe needs some candidates some team member b support but the team member b will not be ready to support because come on i have my own targets i have to cater to my own requisition i don't have time to go ahead and help my team member so internal competition a uh, zero team synergy is what that would be there and towards the end in this kind of culture it will be always the quantity you know because recruiters under competition under stress they will only pump in resumes for the quantity purpose but not from the quality point of view and that would backfire which hiring managers would have failed to understand so that's how so it would be Thank you. And then, you know, thinking about the outcomes of something like that, how, how long do you think those recruiters are going to stick around in that company? 
Oh, if you're talking about today's young gen, they're going to quit in, 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 in you know, four months, five months, six months, or even lesser than that. They're yeah. not like the older generation people who have that patience, like, oh, come on, I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try. And also, okay. All it's right. Great. Well yeah. Yep. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Now let's take a look at an organization that has mainly passive defensive styles. And this is where I call this the run, duck, and hide mentality. All right. So I, I, um, you know, I, I want to, I want to, I want to please you, but I also can't help you, kind of thing. Um, and so uh, people are expected to agree with others, be liked by others, not bring up issues, um, be uh, make a good impression, clear all your decisions with your superiors, and shift responsibilities, and and avoid being blamed. So. In that organization with this exact same scenario, how do you think recruiters might react? They don't want to own the requisitions. They don't want to own the candidates only because um, like, there, uh, I would say that there is a whole lot of ball game that goes in even before the recruiters start recruiting, start sourcing screening all that approvals, you know, requisition approvals, budget approvals, and a lot many things are out there. So both the recruiters, as well as the business partner and specialists, they will just be sitting on waiting for the hiring managers to approve those requisitions saying, you know, okay, let them approve, let them say that yes, Everything is tick marked. The budget is approved. We are good to go. And then I will go ahead and publish the jobs, you know, the requisitions on the job portals internally and everywhere. They will not go ahead and do the follow up because they're like, no, you know, we can't cut, uh, uh, you know, um, we don't have the guts to go and ask because uh, they have a lot of work at their end. And already we have got some kind of a scolding maybe from those uh, you know, business leaders and managers. So we are going to sit quiet. We'll wait for them to come over. And when the management asks questions or anybody in the leadership asks questions, hey, where are we with this means? They would just go ahead and play the blame game saying the hiring manager went ahead and said, uh, you know, we, we are waiting for him to approve. And the hiring manager will go ahead and say, okay, you know what? The team never followed up with me. What do you expect me to do? Do you expect me to sit and remember all of these? I have so many other project milestones to cater to. And in fact, I'm waiting for my supervisor's approval, you see? So yeah, so a lot of blame game pushing and everything happens. Yeah, and, and it seems like a lot of waiting, a lot of waiting around for things to happen, correct? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, all right. Which, by the way, um, sometimes these passive defensive styles will work in tandem with the aggressive defensive styles. So, in other words, if you've got if you've got a whole group of people who are playing the waiting in the blame game, what that happens then is sometimes it creates another group of people that act more aggressively. Again, the aggressive defensive, and and just start ranting and raving and yelling at the folks in the green. And it just creates the swirl effect, okay, um, of red and green. So, okay, let's go on to the next one. All right, now we have an incredibly constructive organization here in which people, uh, they set realistic goals, they work together to solve problems, they gather each other's ideas, they're very team oriented. How might exact same situation then these uh, recruiters, business partners, and hiring managers act in this situation? There will be one word if I have to put it, Kathy and team, it will be synergy, bonding. It is not my responsibility or it's not your responsibility. It's going to be our responsibility, our in quotes. Everybody understand that they have an important role to play in the entire hiring process. The recruiters understand the importance of the closures that have to come in. 
the hiring managers equally understand that, yes, we as the hiring managers, we as the leaders of that particular business unit or organization, it's our responsibility to interview the candidates on time. And as business partners, we are here to extend whatever support it may take for you all to make this happen, to ensure a smooth onboarding. So there will be frequent meetings. Everybody get together. They come with a working agreement saying, we all together are going to create this great hiring experience for the candidates. And not only the team flourishes, you know, they all have this camaraderie out there, but it is getting reflected even to the candidate. The candidate starts feeling really great saying that, wow, there is this company that, that you know, everybody is speaking the same language, you know? Everybody is there. If I need any questions, I want to know more about this business unit culture. Things are being rolled out, you know, in a very beautiful way. So there is a lot of synergy again, and everything works in a healthier manner, I would say. There's, there's a lot of understanding and people are supportive of each other. Okay. And then let's talk a little bit about retention. How long do you think people will work for an organization like this? Oh, they would love to spend their time, their life for this organization. I okay. Would All right. Great. Okay. And so, maybe we should, sorry, Kathy, to interrupt, but maybe we should ask this question to the, to the people out there, you know, what are what do they expect? Or if, if an organization with this kind of culture is out there, what would be their, you know, uh, how would they respond? How would how, how long would they love to stay with this company? So. Yeah, that's a good question. So why don't you pop it into your the chats? And then Amber, why don't you give us, a, while people are doing that, you know, you can give us a sense, uh, and, and Manal, if you're looking at it too, what 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 are people saying in the chats that we should pay attention to? Because I'm not looking at the chats at this point. Perfect, Kathy, I will. Um, and I've been watching the chat. Um, I wanna thank a few people have been listing some questions that we're holding for the end. Uh, so thank you for those questions. We will get to them very shortly. So how long, I'll reiterate the question here, pop it into the chat. How long would you want to work for an organization that had these types of expectations? Or if the chat isn't working for you, uh, feel free to unmute. Shout us a number, how many years? Or maybe days, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, can I say something? <laughs> yes, please, sure. sir, thank you. Um, I believe that this uh, constructive style builds a sort of community-like um, atmosphere within the organization. So I would wanna work here for as long as they would have me. I mean, that's not really that definitive, but I mean, like legit, yeah. I'd want to work here for as long as I can. Mm -hmm. So long mm -hmm. as they, you know, stuck to their style yeah, and not necessarily diverge or have that drastic of a change, I'd legit want to work here until mm -hmm. I retire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Amber. Hmm. A lot of people in the chat have the same um, have the same thought. So thank you for sharing that, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, Where I'm here, I'm seeing till the end, forever and a day, uh, for as long as possible till I retire. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I love this. I would always serve the organization as long as they give me more and more opportunities. Absolutely, that's a part of this. That's an aspect, right? Um, like. Um, um, we we heard in the comments it you know as long as they stay true to their their core forever mm -hmm. forever uh and yeah. people commenting that people employees would thrive in this type of an organization as long as possible um so yeah a lot of yes thoughts yes so you you folks just validated the research that human synergistics has done around recruitment and retention for uh, constructive organizations um, because they've done a lot of research in that too. So you can even check some uh, studies around that. So yes, absolutely. Um, and, and as I once told a colleague, if you have the opportunity once in your life, at least once in your life to work for a constructive organization, 
you will never forget it and you will want to repeat that and create that in your new organization wherever you go so yes it's a very powerful amber you know what there's a there's a question right now in the chat kathy that i think is pertinent to answer right now um, okay. uh, and someone asked is the constructive style sustainable in the long run if you could tend to that momentarily it is um, it, at the same time, uh, uh, yes, and I would say yes, because there's some studies that human synergistics has done where organizations have sustained this cultural style over the long haul um, and even tossed out a CEO that was pulling it back down, okay? However, it takes a lot of work and a lot of attention on the part of not only senior management, but al also the employees to be able to say, this is the culture we wanna create and that we wanna to work together to create that culture. So it's not just top management. Management does have an impact. Certainly they have a lot of influence, but it's everybody in that organization that says, this is the culture that we wanna have. Amber and Lakshmi, do you have any other thoughts on that? Completely agree with you, Kathy. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Agreed. It's uh, I, the only thing I'll add to that is that um, I want to emphasize what Kathy said is that it takes work and intention. Uh, and if it, back to the, um, the comment that was made around, you know, uh, as long as they stay true to their nature, it takes, it takes work. And if, if the company was to change um, a new leader, like Kathy mentioned, a new leader comes in and maybe that the expectations shift and that's not kept in check, that could radically change the culture that you're experiencing. Uh, in a not so nice way. Uh, so as long as there was that intention and that focus on the goal, on the goal of having a constructive culture, that's really big. And then yeah. everybody, everybody plays a part in that. Kathy um, alluded to that, that every single person in the organization from the bottom to the top plays a part in creating a constructive culture and holding each other to constructive expectations. Yes. And in the United States, I'm not quite sure about other countries, we have, we have a number of uh, uh, union um, management unions and, 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 and unions, Amber and I also believe that unions and union leaders have a large impact in working not only with the administrative management of an organization, but working hand in hand to work with the organizations and, and spread the kind of constructive culture that they want. So. Um, let's go to the next one. And so um, I, I just want to give you some uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, and this is so what does this mean for agile? And I think uh, Lakshmi. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you were going to talk about that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But before, before I touch upon this quickly in the interest of time, um, yeah. when Amber was saying that the intention, the focus, the two words that pop up, popped in my mind are the two Ps, patience and perseverance. Mm -hmm. We are dealing with people. At no point of time, you know, like, let, let's be frank enough, honest enough that, you know, as you all said, both of you said, it takes time to get these blue spikes, you know, throughout. But if the leaders, if even the team for that man, matter, they don't have the patience and perseverance to write through this and work together to make these blue, you know, the blue spikes come up, things are not going to work. So it's, it's like, uh, who owns this? Definitely, you know, it's not the people operations, not the job of the HR. It is the job of each and every one within the organization, starting from the board of directors to the top leadership team, to the managers, other seniors, and even the people who are out there doing the actual operational work too. So it's everybody's responsibility to work together to make this happen, I would say. Anyways, yeah. um, so what does this mean for HR, right? There has been this research that human synergistics conducted with the Tennessee Tech University. Um, there is a handout, a link to this, uh, you know, I believe if you all have not received, you might receive it once again, but I would urge you all to go through that. And it all talks about the study was done mainly, you know, with a very 
future futuristic thought that it's the agile era, you know. And the Tennessee Tech University students are going to become the young gen, you know, workforce in a couple of years, right? So if the world is talking about agile software development and all of that, what can the university do to build in the agile mindset for the students so that they, the teacher, the academicians, and everybody in the college, everybody in the university are working together to instill this mindset and you know internalize it, okay? So definitely a wonderful study. We can always share this once again, but do go through this. And definitely it's exciting to see that the agile experts, even though the sample size was just four, but still they've saying that constructive culture, agile will happen where there is constructive culture, you know? Um, and uh, there, there is this famous quote, right? That culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, so transformation will be zero if the culture doesn't uh you know make that happen right um yeah. yes Kathy, over to you so so now i would like to give you some um advice from our, our perspective having worked with um, organizations and transformation and even uh the lean total quality back in the day um areas and so if you have constructive styles and you want to implement agile lean you go just go if you already have an organization with constructive styles go and, and let me just preface this a little bit if you have the opportunity to do a culture study even before you start so that you know where you are it helps okay because if this is where you are you you simply start embedding it you get the leadership to buy in you engage the teams to set some goals you train you give freedom you set ground rules you institutionalize the mindset and reinforce behaviors um, you're if you are a consultant or an internally or externally you are working with a dream team um, and they are hungry to have this information and they put it into practice and it's beautiful okay so go. So now if you have do, done or if you find yourself in an organization that is mainly aggressive defensive, okay, I would say the first thing to keep in mind is it's going to take longer, a lot longer. You can't just be talking about the mindset and the procedures and the processes and put up the different boards and say we're going to do this or that or the other because you don't have the teamwork built for this to work. And so what you need to do at this point is find the change champions at the leadership level, because I will be honest, probably a lot of the aggressive defensive styles come from top leadership that may be focused on results and not on people. And so that has to start there with what are we focused on and, and they have to get that mindset in place. And then it's about building teamwork throughout the organization. Now you can use agile and lean processes and methods and as a tool to build that teamwork. But I would also say beyond um, just the initial training, I would highly recommend either finding or training capable facilitators to continue to build that teamwork throughout the organization and help resolve conflicts. Because what you're gonna have in an aggressive defensive style is a lot of conflict, okay? And it'll be right in your face conflict. And so what you be, need to be able to do is help people learn how to work through that and come out with win-win solutions. So, um, and, and where you can start building, breaking down the silos between two units who must trade information and work together. Recognizing and rewarding cross-functional efforts is really important. And the, here's the key thing. If, as Edgar Schein says, it takes shared learning and mutual learning and shared experiences, then what you need to do is create this new narrative. So as you continue to start to succeed with these new behaviors, and you in new teaming and new collaboration, you build that new narrative and you talk about how we are succeeding so that it becomes part of the culture. If that makes sense. Okay. 
Let's go to the passive defensive style. So remember, this is the style that is uh, run, duck, and hide, or wait, wait, wait. Okay. So um, again, it's going to take longer because in an organization that is highly passive defensive, you can introduce agile, you can agile, I'm sorry, you can introduce it, you can do the training, and everybody will fold their hands and look at you and say, well, that's very nice. What do you want me to do now? Okay. And so um, it's part of it again is getting the leadership because it might actually be leaders doing that the same thing. So you need to get leadership to commit to the new roles and behavior first. And we also talked about that in the aggressive defensive styles. But this time, possibly the leaders are the folks doing avoiding. Maybe they aren't making decisions. They aren't being clear about their expectations, et cetera. So they have to understand and really adopt these behaviors. Now you can use agile and lean practices to start creating that, okay? And then I would say find champions throughout the organization and you want to engage them in the work because you know what? It might be nice to see the boss say this, but at the same time, my colleague next door to me who is saying the same thing, that's going to be as important to me um, in this passive defensive style that's going to bring me along. Okay, setting clear project goals. Um, a lot of training and coaching is going to be needed to reinforce because, again, folks in a passive defensive uh, styles, they are afraid to move. They're afraid to make decisions. They're afraid to do things. So coaching and helping and, and helping them see where they can make decisions and where they can be active, it will be important. And then feedback loops is going to be really important again. Um, between managements, between teams, et cetera, and employees. And, um, and that is kind of where we are uh, for opening it up. Lakshmi, I turn it to you and Amber for questions. Okay. Uh, would you like me to, I have two questions that are sitting and holding right now. Do you want those two first Lakshmi? Please go ahead, Amber. I, I have to scroll up, sorry, <laughs> that would be you. No, that's all right, I've got them. I got you covered. So um, the first one was, is change a prerequisite to learning or is learning a prerequisite to change or do they all work interchangeably? Wow, that is, for me, that's a question uh, we could spend hours talking about. Um, and I will pass that one to Lakshmi actually. <laughs> I cannot. So. Kathy, please share your words of wisdom, and then I will support. I, you know, I, I really, I really can't tell you. Um, I can't tell you what comes first. You know, so I, I would just say from my own experience, sometimes we, uh, we experience massive change that we have not wanted. Let's put it that way: a layoff, a pandemic. Okay, and we weren't anticipating, and then we have to learn. Okay. Um, and sometimes the learning is hard and it's painful. And other times uh, we, we go to classes, we go to school, we, we learn new ways to be, and that actually changes what we see as our opportunities. So I think it's a both and, it's not an either or, and I think they are intertwined. Agree, agree, Kathy. Oh, I call that as the genius of and, like uh, there, there is this, the tyranny of R and the genius of and. So for the change in learning, yeah. it's always the genius of and, I would say. Right. Agree. So you guys say that they are basically in a symbiotic relationship with each other, where oh. one yeah. can't do without the other. Yes. I, I would agree. Uh, I would agree. Is it Cebu? Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yes. Very good. Yes. Well said. Thank you very much. Well said. Symbiotic. Always, I love that word. Yes. He always says it well, Kathy. He's a great rock star. Yes. I, I just love his contribution. Yeah. Yeah. We always appreciate when someone from the audience can say it a little bit more eloquently than we can um, with all the thoughts scrolling through. So thank you. Uh, one more question that I had uh, uh, seen in the chat before 
And this this one might be for holding for later, but maybe you can give us a tidbit. I think this is for Lakshmi more. Um, someone asked about a hybrid combination scrum ban uh, and wanting to know a little bit more about that. Okay, who is that individual? Could you please share the name if that's okay? If you have it, uh, Amber, I would love to address. Um, but yes, don't scroll. Um, it's okay. Leave it. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, oh I thought you said. It was me. I thought you were me. saying. Okay, thank you. Sir. I was. I thought you said don't scrub her name, and I went. Oh, oh no, 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 don't scrub. Do that. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, it was so, my question. Okay, Teju. So, Just, yeah. So the scrum ban is more about you know we are getting in, we are fusing or amalgaming the best of scrum aspects and the best of Kanban aspects, right? When we say scrum aspects, it's more from the roles perspective, you know, like a lead who looks into like a scrum master or a lead who conducts or facilitates those huddles. Um, and then there are cadences, ceremonies, like the huddles, planning, everything happens. But then there is also this, I mean, you need to have a board, you need to visualize something out there to even have this conversation and that's where the kanban comes in and that's what the bond of scrum right that's where the scrum bond comes so it's a fusion of cadences conversations but you're doing that looking visually over what's out there on the boards and and you know talk about the project so discuss about the blockers and so forth so that is a way of opening uh, yeah. up you know yes, like yes. constructive culture so, uh, yeah, go on. Yes. Uh, so uh, I would like to know uh, which would be the more effective, like Kanban or uh, the combination, the hybrid combination, which would be more effective? Answer it to, you know, think yourself. You just have a visual board out there. Just looking at the board, all the team looking at the board will be more constructive and effective. Are uh -huh. everybody getting together and having conversations and talking about what's there on the board? Why this is why the status of the project is like this. What can be done to enhance it would be more better. If you're thinking about the latter, then the answer would be Scrum Ban. If you're thinking the first would be, then your answer would be Kanban. So think it over, ponder on this, and you will get the answer. Because um, yeah, I mean, boats don't do the talking, right? Peju and everyone, people do the conversations. You know, you have to have meaningful conversations, and that's where the concept of scrum band comes in yes thank you thank you so much any other questions from anyone holding one in the i sibu you have uh, your hand up one more um yeah i just wanted to ask uh does organizational size determine the effectiveness of cultural um implementation that's a good question kathy yeah. you want to take that one yeah, it, it affects the speed of organ of cultural. Um, there's two things that affect the speed of transformation. Number one is the size is and because frankly, um, I, and this is only personal opinion, but if you can put the whole company in one room and talk to them at once, it's going to be a lot faster to communicate versus if you have a uh, 150,000 people worldwide. Right. Yeah. All right. But the second thing that has an impact is how strongly held are those expectations. And um, and that's one of the things that you can measure with this instrument that we have been talking about, this organizational culture inventory, because when they measure, they also measure how strongly people hold something. Um, and so, for instance, take the take the. Uh, um, Take the example of a possibly a negative expectation, which is that I am uh, I'm just I just got to go along with others, right? Now, um, and I I don't want to raise my voice. I don't want to. I can't because if I do, you know, somebody might uh, attack me or tell me I'm wrong and or whatever. And so, if you if you think if you think that's the expectation, and and ninety percent of the people in the organization say that that's going to be harder to change than if, if half the folks in the organization say that and the other half don't. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And so they actually look at and they, they'll do the mean calculations and they tell you how strongly held something is. And so um, 
my experience is that even in larger organizations, if they have uh, not, if, if some of the expectations aren't strongly held, in other words, it's weak acceptance, it's weak agreement around some of these things, it's much easier to change. It's much easier to change. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Salelo, I saw your hand up next, sir. Yes, yes. Um, I, I want to ask a question. I don't know if Madam Katie there uh, will be able to answer my question because I, I'm asking my question in terms of a South African context, specifically looking at the issues of HR recruitment process. Oh, you froze up on us. Okay. Uh, in, in South Africa, a lot of, a lot of companies in, in South Africa, they have adopted a system, an, an online system, which is known uh, as the applicant tracking system. Basically what this system do is they, when we apply, we apply, we submit our CVs online, they take our CVs to that, to that system. So the system, uh, it's like, uh, it uh, uh, select the CVs that can go forward to the um, hands of the hiring manager or the HR there. From the teachings of Kate there, I can consider that ATS system applicate, uh, applicant uh, a tracking system as a constructive culture to, to, to those organizations that are using such kind of a system. But it is a concern to us because our CVs get rejected because of that system, because it is programmed. There are key ways there that it identifies so that the CVs can, can maneuver or can go through the, the system. Mm -hmm. So my question to Madam Katie there, Kate mm -hmm. uh, what advice can you give to some of us who are struggling, who are applying, but are getting rejected every time when we apply because of, because of this system, because of this, organizational uh, uh, what can I, a culture that they have adopted of um, taking our CVs to go through the process of online verification. Yeah, I, I am so sorry to hear that because I hear that, I do hear that a lot and I'm sure Lakshmi, you hear that a lot too. I mean, uh, in the United States, there's the same issue around that, you know, with uh, CVs and I, uh, Many applicants I know look for the right words to put in so that the machines pick them out, right? So um, my, my suggestion to you and the way that uh, people are talking in the United States about the best way to get a job is to not worry as much about the CVs as to, as to networking with other folks. Because, um, and I don't know about South Africa, but in my experience, when, um, if you were to come to me and we have a long chat and we have a talk, I find out more about what you like and where you're going and what you wanna do. If I see an opportunity, I might say, hey, I know a guy, his name is Solelo. You, you should be, I think you should be in touch with him or I would put you in touch with that person. And so um, in the United States, anyway, uh, they are talking a lot about doing networking uh, with other people and, and LinkedIn can help with that, you know? Um, although I, I would say, since I'm not in that ball game, I don't, I don't do that, you know what I mean? But uh, that's what I would do is it's time to talk, talk to people, network, talk to real people and start telling your story. Lakshmi, I'm gonna ask you what you think. The question that, that people have to think through is that who is going ahead and designing this applicant tracking system? People or the company. Again, in that company, who is doing it? The people. So do the people understand the essence of creating a great candidate experience through the system, right? I mean, the system is not functioning in vacuum algorithms are being written in a way so that it responds to whatever get, is getting into the system, right? So if we have to create constructive culture, if an organization, let's say, is using an applicant tracking system, they have to be really cognizant about this fact 
that they talk to that vendor, whoever has given that applicant tracking system asking, is there a way for even for me to go ahead and tweak in or customize or personalize the messages that would be relayed out to the candidates, hiring managers and all. If only and if there is this opportunity, let me know because I want to create, as a company, I want to create a positive candidate experience. That means I should have the complete right to personalize the rejection emails, personalize any other message that goes through talking about the interview scheduling and all of that. So it is not, please don't blame the system. Please take it upon you that, or take it upon or believe that the people who are designing the system, they have to own it. They have to put in all of those, uh, you know, uh, feeders, you know, that, that has to go in. So, yeah, I hope I was. Yeah. So, so in other words, I guess, Salelo, I was talking about a workaround, right? A bypass to that system for uh, candidates that, uh, that people employ here. So that if you can get to the hiring manager, the hiring manager tells HR, I want, I want that person, you know, get them on board. So, yeah, yeah. Great, good discussion there. Um, yeah. Kirsty, uh, Kirsty, I saw your hand was up. You took it down. Do you still have a question you'd like to share? Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so my question is related to culture change. Um, what if you're in an organization and it has this culture, um, but you're trying to, how can I say, implement it just within a small team first um, in, in a sense of, you know, if things go well with this team and then we'll take it a step further to implement it in an, another team and another team, how would you go about that in terms of um, how would you implement this change? That, that's a really good question. And in fact, that's often a way things do start to change in organizations is that a team starts and says, we're gonna do things a little differently here. Um, at, at some point, you, you probably will need to enroll your manager, your supervisor in how you wanna work differently because then that person, and, and, and I will ask anyone else who's got experience in this to also um, talk about this, but that person then, that person will need to protect your little group uh, from being impinged upon by the rest of the organization. In fact, often I see that in cells of the organization where you've got uh, constructive clusters blossoming and the uh, managers and supervisors take care that um, to kind of fend off um, other things going on that may disrupt that. And, now, in a larger organization, if you've got a number of these cells, hopefully these managers start saying, well, look at what's going on there and what's going on there and what's going on there. What can we learn from that? And, what, and how can we start changing that? So let me ask uh, Lakshmi and Amber, what do you think? Amber, please go on. I don't want to keep talking, 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 sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I'll... Here, I'll let you have a moment to craft your answer, Lakshmi, and I'll, I'll throw in my bit. Uh, so I, I totally agree with Kathy, and it's and this is can, this can be a really beautiful way for culture change to start in an organization, um, especially when we talk about um, critical mass. So within an organization, we need a certain amount of people to be able to be on board with change. And they tend to be the, the energy, the energy within the organization to start pushing that change and and recruiting people to them to make that change. And so if a team is really conscious about their contribution to the organization, how they're working together, what they're getting out of it, what kind of outcomes they're producing for the organization, they can kind of take the reins and say, look, we're gonna, we're gonna push this effort out and we're gonna start to get more and more people. And uh, that little base team can be so powerful. So. I think it's a beautiful place to start and it's it's never too late, it's never too early. It's whenever it happens, it is the right time and go with it. What one but other keep thing the energy is, going. I recall uh, back about 20 years ago, I was working with a manufacturing company that had uh, various locations 
And, um, and uh, so we did a culture study with that manufacturing organization and they specifically wanted to look at the various locations because they said some locations are more productive and effective than others. And so we wanna see what's going on. So they did, they did a little mini culture maps of each of these locations. And lo and behold, they found that the most productive location had a constructive culture. All the others did not, all right? Now, the other thing that was really interesting and blew them away, you know, at the, at the executive level is this was a managerless sub, uh, subunit. <laughs> so in other words, they didn't have a supervisor present. They didn't have a manager present. It was the team. The team had created this constructive culture and they were such high performing unit that the rest of the company was like, what is going on with that team? And then when they found out it, none of them were there, that was probably one of the reasons, um, you know, it really kind of prompted a long-term uh, look at themselves and culture change within the organization. So, yeah. Anything so, to add Lakshmi to that one? No, uh, so what Kathy talks about is the self-organizing teams, right? It's the team power uh, that, that comes into play. And that's what Agile talks in its own way, uh, I would say. Um, and it's, it's absolutely important. Doing that massive change can have a drastic effect, you know, a negative impact, if, if I may say so. But if we do that, you know, piloted, we experimented with, then it's always good. It's always good to see, okay, there are some things to learn from this particular pilot, small change that we are coming together and doing, and then we are making ourselves better. So we as a team who has initiated the change are doing this, acting on it. We are introspecting later and seeing what improvements we as a team can do and pass it on to the next pilot or, you know, at another to the other team level. So it's more about we ourselves are also refining, fine tuning ourselves as facilitators, as chain champions throughout this entire process. And that becomes a positive, you know, movement towards that whole transformation that would come at some point of time. And, and Amber, for the question, no, not question, sorry, you said, right? the energy piece, right? So I, I should, I, I must say that Kirsty is one of the energy driven person in our team. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so very rightly put by Amber. Yeah, thank you, Kirsty. Okay. Um, I have Thanks. a follow up question, if you guys don't mind. Um, reg okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, regarding uh, implementing this type of change, but in a remote setting, in a remote work setting, because it seems, you know, we working with people, it would be better to do that, you know, face to face, everybody's together. How do you how do you um, work around those barriers in terms of remote remote work? Uh, um, that's a really good question. And um, I, I, I can have some clues, but I would actually refer you to human synergistics did some study about that on, on virtual teams already and um, has, a, has, has a few white papers and studies on these things that will talk about what they've learned about culture. But um, just uh, anecdotally, I, I would suggest that part of it is spending time um, not simply on task. Remember, we talk about just focusing on task and focusing on relationships, but the whole team side of it is really to understand and, and do the, the, the team maintenance needed to pull it together, getting to know one another as a team um, and not just working, working, working on task, task, task. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, for for uh, any anyone interested in that topic, I did put a link in the in the chat uh, from Human Synergistics on one of their blogs around remote working, uh, just as a starting place. So yeah. uh, there's there are two more questions in the chat that I'd like to get to. One, Musa, just so you know, uh, I'm I'm going to answer yours in a moment when we get to next steps. There was a question about how culture even is formed and starts. So I will take that one in a moment. Uh, but uh, this other question, I'd like. 
I'd like to hand over to Kathy and, and Lakshmi. What are the chances of an aggressive style organization to change to a constructive style organization? Um, I, I, this is who, I think it was Cebu who asked about uh, whether it is change that comes first and then learning or learning that comes first. So aggressive organizations um, have a tendency to uh, when the market is, let's think Amazon. I don't know if you get Amazon, but Amazon is well known actually in the United States to have a pretty aggressive culture. However, they pretty much have a lock on the market here. And so um, even though I have known so many people um, that have quit Amazon, um, and they can't even retain people and they can barely keep it, keep the, a workforce going, they are making money. And so they look at their culture and they say, ah, we obviously have it, you know? And now, but that's because they've got a lock on the market at this point. If that was to change and there was a whole, um, people, people talk about it as, you know, um, I, can't, I can't even remember the, the the terms around it, but it's where a whole technology, a whole, you know, the pandemic has changed how we think about work too. And so that if you have like a sea change in the market or you, you lose your edge in the marketplace, um, you now, they've got some change. You may not be productive anymore. And all of a sudden you have to start thinking about what is causing this and what do we have to change? So I would say that it is harder, okay, for aggressive defensive organizations to change if they are making money, okay, period, all right? Because that's how they measure it. Once they stop making money or they can't keep their workforce, um, they may look at themselves a little differently because the research has showed that aggressive defensive organizations are very volatile in, in the marketplace because they cannot adapt. They cannot adapt. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. All right. Um, I the the other question, which um, uh, what makes organizations to develop a certain culture? Um, are we are we there to talk about some next steps? Yeah. yeah. Let's can we go to the next couple of pages and, and we'll do that. So this is for you folks. Um, a lot more resources. Let me explain. If you would like more information about the human synergistics tools and models, there's a great place to go on the internet. Um, and that is the, the link that, uh, that you'll get. And it is a, it's a fun thing to do because you've got that circumplex and you can play with it. You can see not only what the cultural styles are, but then how those how individuals shape those styles, what the impact of leaders and managers are, how teams act under those different styles. So it's a fun way to learn about that circumplex. And, um, and then if you really want uh, more information on that study that we talked about uh, for agile and culture, you can get a, a, a more of a summary of that study, like four page summary. If you want the whole thing, um, Lakshmi can send it to you. And, and then there's a wonderful book uh, on which, with wonderful stories about organizations that have tr transformed their cultures in lots of different ways, including organizations that had lean and agile already in, in, in it and worked with some of those things. And again, there's countries all over the United States that are part um, of these, these stories here. So I'd highly recommend that, that book as well. And next slide. Okay. Um, so if, if people are interested to learn or, you know, they need that support to go ahead and build, or I would say cult cultural assessment and transformation or even leadership assessment and all. So these are some of the tools that are for me and Peterson, as well as cultural agents, we have done that in the past, and you are more than welcome to reach out either to Kathy, Amber, or me for that. Right. Amber, so, for you, this is the stage is all yours for this. All right. First, I just want to I want to uh, let you know that there are some links in the chat. If you're curious, 
from the study, the, the summaries of the study that Kathy was referring to, uh, the link to play with the circumplex, it's fantastic, that's in there as well. Uh, so to, to get back to your question, Musa, I'm finally there. So what, how do organization, how does organizational culture even form? So what you see up on the screen right now is called the culture or the, the culture journey learning experience. So what this is, this is also from Human Synergistics and it's an awesome way. I, I think Kirsty had asked about the team. She has now left, but uh, um, for everybody else online, this is a great way for teams to start experiencing culture and digging in deeper to start understanding uh, better about how do we, how is culture formed? How do we change it? And to where do we go from here? So um, to briefly answer the question though, about how culture is formed, this is the first part of this culture experience, the, cu uh, the culture journey. It's all about the founders. It really starts with them. Who is the one that puts together the company and first has their own vision and goals that they um, imbue into the organization? It, it's really about that person and their values. So if they have, if they come in and they have very constructive values, the organization can uh, really start out on a great foot. Not always, it depends on who else is on the team and what is happening, what kind of expectations are passed down from those values, because our ideals are, can be different from our current culture and what we experience now. That said though, that, uh, that founder has a huge part to play. And then as the organization evolves, the, per, the people that come in, uh, to take over from the founder, they're the ones that then can start to shift it one way or another, getting way back to that question about how long would you work for a constructive organization? Maybe forever, as long as they stayed with their word, right? There are CEOs or other organizational leaders that can come in and change that. And so then it's up to who else is involved and who else can help steer the ship to keep it on the path that you want it to be. Or if it's not in the right place, how can you, like we've been talking about, generate energy within the organization to start to get that critical mass of let's change. We want change. Let's do it now. We're in. Let's go. So um, anyway, about the culture journey, learn, culture journey uh, if you are interested in participating in this or having this as a part of your own company, as, as you start entering the market, going into an organization and implementing agile, uh, agile, uh, mindsets in your organization, you know, give us a call, send us an email. Uh, let's talk about how maybe we can bring this to you in some way. So it's a, it's a fantastic experience for people and a great learning or a great starting point if you do want to do a culture study within your organization. Thanks. Watch me, Kathy. Yep. Assembler. Okay. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, for, for being there, it's, it's way beyond that one hour, but then thank you for all, you know, being there, listening. And thank you so much, Kathy, Amber, as well as Laura for being here. And um, yeah, yeah, look forward to your words of wisdom in more of upcoming webinars, Kathy and Amber, and, and everybody would definitely be enlightened. And um, yeah, they would be carrying a lot of, lot of insights you know that will build them in their future for sure so thank you so so very much yeah and and thank you for uh participating and uh especially those who had the courage to show their faces throughout this whole thing this was helpful thank you very much i appreciate it so um that helps that helps me um be a better speaker with you so thanks okay thank you all and um, i have Put in the email ID of Kathy over there. Mine is, of course, over there. So feel free to email Kathy, reach out to her directly or even to me. Um, and, and we're there for you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Before we wrap up, I just want to say thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you so much, uh, Amber and Mrs. Ms. Lakshmi. This was such a wonderful session, very insightful. So on behalf of the CL team, uh, we thank you all for joining us today and we hope you all enjoyed uh, this session and enjoy the rest of your day. We keep having these webinars once or twice every month. So if you find today's session useful, stay tuned as we have more coming up. 
please, if you have any questions to ask about cultural regions or anything really related to this session, contact us and email us at transform at culturalregions.com. It will be on the chat box. And also, please, guys, um, 